Welcome to Betrayal Recovery Radio, the official podcast of APSATS, the Association of Partners of Sex Addict Trauma Specialists, hosted by Dr. Jake Porter. APSATS is a nonprofit organization providing professional training and compassionate support to partners affected by problematic sexual behavior and betrayal trauma. In each episode, Dr. Jake guides a conversation of enlightening insights and practical tools to empower those affected by sex addiction and betrayal trauma to use their voices and live their values. The mission of Betrayal Recovery Radio is to offer hope to those in need of healing and growth to those moving through grief. And now, here's your host, Dr. Jake Porter. Welcome to another episode of Betrayal Recovery Radio. I am your host, Dr. Jake Porter, and I am so uh, excited to let you know about the show we've got for you today. So um, APSATS is is an incredible nonprofit organization that provides training and support and advocacy for uh, betrayed partners of sex addicts. And today we have joining us two founding board members. Uh, Dan Drake and Janice Cottle have both been working in the field of psychotherapy for many years. They were on the founding board of APSATS, and they've been grateful to see the organization really blossom from a grassroots effort to support betrayed partners into an organization that provides support and resources to betrayed partners and coaches and therapists across the world. Um, Dan uh, is out in California where he works with Banyan Therapy Group, his practice, and uh, he is an LMFT and an LPCC, so both a marriage and family therapist and a professional counselor. Uh, he's a CSAT. Uh, he's APSAT certified. And Janice Cottle is uh, out of Texas here, and she's a clinical psychologist and a CSAT and also APSAT certified. And uh, both of them have done lots of trainings, uh, written books. Uh, today, though, they're going to talk about um, some work that they've done together, writing about disclosure, disclosure preparation, how all that works, and trying to provide resources for that process. You know, we talk about disclosure a lot, but the fact is it's massively important uh, for almost every couple who is moving through a process of recovery and healing from sex addiction, betrayal trauma. There are lots of ways to do disclosures. And that's one of the things that we're going to talk about today is all the options that are out there. And, and so I want you to know, listener, that if you're finding yourself in a situation where maybe you're helping professionals saying, oh, it's got to be this way and that's not sitting right with you, uh, be empowered. Listen to this podcast. Hear about the different choices that you have and um, reach out and, 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 and get support if you need that from Dan, from Janice, from me, from others uh, who are trained by APSATS so that we can help you really move through a process of, of recovery and healing that's the right fit for you. Um, Dan and Janice are both really fun, delightful people. They're smart as a whip, both of them. And uh, I even get to do a little lightning round with them at the end and put, put the pressure on. So sit back and enjoy my conversation with Dan Drake and Janice Cottle. Well, hello, Dan and Janice. Great to have you guys. Thank Great you to be here, here, Jake. Yes. Jake. Hey, it's, I love love your work, love being with you, and looking forward to this um, this conversation on disclosures. Uh, that's something y'all thought about a little bit, right? <laughs> Gosh. Um, <laughs> just a bit. <laughs> right. Maybe, maybe more than we care to. Right. So why don't we actually start there? Why don't you tell our listeners just how much thought you have put into disclosure, both uh, individually and together, some of the work you do and the work you've done together? Dan, why don't you go first? Yeah, so um, Janice and I have known each other for a number of years, being on the APSATS board from the beginning. Um, and I don't even know how many years ago this was, but it must have been six. Janice? It was a different era. It, it was a different era. <laughs> but we, we were working on another project. And long story short, we decided um, we kind of put together the materials we had on disclosure just to see, could we put a little workbook together? Um, a practical workbook for, for clients uh, that started be like, Oh, we had, we had more than we thought, but that little project turned into a giant undertaking. And a couple years later, we finally put out a, a couple of workbooks for, <laughs> for uh, preparing the person doing the disclosing and the partner for, for the disclosures. 
Yeah, they were going to be really tiny because what we figured all we'd have to do is just write what we actually do with clients to prep them. And it turns out that you can like do you you can you can speak um, much more efficiently than you can write. And I think that as we were doing it, we both realized how much we actually do. Wow. You know, to try to with sure. really good integrity, with clinical soundness, with uh, concern for each of the individuals and the, the heart of the relationship as well. It, it turned out to be a lot. And um, I learned a lot of stuff like from Dan, like, you know, Dan would be writing something for his, you know, for the, the addicts. And I would read it. And it's like, oh, my gosh, I've got to prepare partners for that. They have no idea what that is. Um, wow. They're not going to know how to interpret that. It's going to look like um, an excuse. And then the, the the same thing. I would write something for partners and dance like, oh, I gotta I gotta warn, I gotta I gotta have a you know c- counterpart for that in the workbook. And so it really grew, um, it, and it grew also because we, we take the stand of, of of really sort of doing it from the perspective of partner betrayal trauma, right? Which means right. that we really had to attend to um, the people who need the more. You know, the more preparation as well as the people who, you know, are at a different starting point when they jump into the process. Sure. Yeah. And and it is not a little notebook. It is a tour de force. Uh, and and it's something for you all to be definitely be proud of. And I know that it's making a difference in a lot of couples lives uh, as they're helping professionals are using it. But let's back up here. Let's back up. Let's say there's someone this is their first time to listen to Betrayal. Uh, recovery radio and um so they're like what what are you talking about what's this disclosure thing so what is a full disclosure a full therapeutic disclosure um either one of you take it away you want to take it janice (laughs) thanks dan (laughs) i'll take it if you want (laughs) maybe we do what like we normally do we we kind of go back and forth on a lot of things that's sort of how i think we fleshed it out to what I think is is a thorough process. And and by the way, they are big books, but you don't necessarily have to do all of them. Right. Like if you're right. you know, if you're at the beginning of this, you probably should. But we wanted to develop a process that I'll I'll speak from the partner side to get her what she needs in order to to assess her situation, to figure out what her needs are to make some choices from an informed stance. And that's truth. Mm. But we wanted a process that's that's not the, the typical process that we hear, the, the sort of really escalated right. cycles between couples, like, you know, the midnight, um, you know, the trapped in the bathroom, the kinds of things that from the partner's perspective, um, like she feels like she, if she, the only shot to get truth is to ask the absolute per- perfect alibu bo- by, you know, loopholes free right. question. Um, and that, and that um, it, it's not coming as this instant response to the, you know, the first instinct, which is to tell how much, how much do I think she knows or, um, you know, what, where am I and what am I willing to disclose at a place where maybe I'm still the, in really early recovery, we wanted a process that really helped the addict prepare for that as well. Yeah. And so that with that preparation, we wanted it to be like, like joint, like a his and hers, you know, kind of companion to that. So everybody's using the same language, the same concepts, the sort of, you know, the same boundary exercises so it really does feel like it's syncing up um, for a process that allows the full truth to come out. And maybe, Dan, you want to kind of pick it up from full truth? Yeah. I mean, I think at its most basic, if we're just defining the process, it would be a process of unveiling truth, the whole truth, the whole truth to what the partner wants to know, no right. more, no less. So on one end of the spectrum, you can have... Uh, someone who, this is a pretty typical story, the staggered disclosure situation, which we don't call disclosures. Those are staggered confessions, um, where I'm sharing 
a minimal amount of information or just enough information holding some things back. So that's, that's one end. And then on the other end of the spectrum is I, maybe I feel convicted after a retreat or something and I'm, you know, unburdening myself with everything, confessing everything to my partner. We, and we don't want either end of those spectrums. We want to give all the information to the partner without putting too much out there where, where it's now about, you know, the addicts unburdening right. themselves of shame. Right. Yeah. And, and so why do this, right? Especially I'm thinking about maybe a listener who is the one that would be doing the disclosing and he or she's thinking, I don't want to hurt this. That's going to just hurt my partner even more, right? That's just going to do more damage. So, so why are we actually calling this full disclosure therapeutic at the same time? I love that question. Can I, can I take that, Janice? <laughs> Sure. <laughs> um, it, it, by the way, thank you, Jake, cause that, that makes sense. And, and addict logic, it makes sense because the, the fact is disclosures are painful. Disclosures can be traumatic. I mean, we have data that shows this, so it's not, that's true. It will be painful to hear the information. Um, and, and we can't deny that. Um, but the, the damage done by not sharing in our experience is so much greater. Because once part of the truth comes out, once the partner discovers something or some part of this comes out, they want to know what the rest of it is. So I, I often use the analogy. It's like I, I get a, a possible cancer diagnosis. So, you know, we, we know we don't know how bad it is, but we know there may be cancer there or there's some tumor. We don't know if it's benign. We don't know if it's malignant. We don't know how, how bad it is. So once we know that there's a tumor, most of us most of us would actually want to know the, the, what we're dealing with here. So, and that's what kind of the disclosure is. What are we dealing with? What's the extent of the, the betrayal? Because with betrayal comes deception and lies and minimizations and gaslighting potentially. So we're trying to get to the extent of, of all this in a way that's actually helpful for the couple. Yeah. What but would you add, Maybe Janice? I'd like to sort yeah. of add in there that from the partner perspective, the the root is deception, it's secrets. And so the, the you know, um, the restoration of, of like truth is really important. And it's not just um, the betrayals themselves because part of the betrayal is if, if I'm the partner um, and, and you're, you know, you're the betrayer, Jake, you chose what information you chose what to tell me it's 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 who controls the flow of information right. that should be kind of equally shared and so some partners don't want tons and tons of detail and we honor and respect that but it's it's also about disabling one person controlling the flow of information that dramatically affects the entire coupleship that contaminates the foundation right yeah it's like it's like if I had known that information, I could have chosen differently, right? You managing the information disempowers me to choose how I show up in this relationship. And yeah. how is that safe? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, um, so what are like practically some of the benefits of people going through this, but also at the same time, what are some of the risks? Cause there are risks as well, right? So let's talk risk and benefits. You want to take this one first, Janice? Yeah. So, so part of the risk, and and it's a realistic risk, is that that things can blow up. Um, some people, um, some people aren't are um, not good at assessing their mm. readiness for handling really painful information, or um, and and even when the ultimate outcome like um, maybe from both individuals being empowered in a relationship, ultimately being able to heal, there's almost always going to be a period where the relationship feels really rocky. Uh, you know, it's the out of the surgery, but in recovery room kind of piece to that. Mm -hmm. And so, the, and, and sometimes for a partner, you find out information that you realize I can't live with, or now there's this real dilemma. Sure. So there's, there's really soul searching personal work, mm. you know, um, that not everybody, 
not everybody likes soul searching personal work, like perhaps the, you know, the three of us. <laughs> yeah. Dan, anything yeah. you'd add to that? Yeah. I mean, to your point, Janice, it, it usually, things do usually get worse before they get better. I mean, these disclosures can be really beautiful, sacred healing experiences for couples. I've seen them really, can be really beautiful and connecting, but they can be really painful and difficult and disconnecting too. Um, so that's a, a risk, of course. Uh, big benefit, obviously, is that now we have a relationship that doesn't have a, a that's not built on a foundation of deception and dishonesty. It's right. now a relation that's relationship that's based on a foundation of honesty. Mm -hmm. And yeah. what that can be rebuilt into is incredibly valuable, and beautiful, and unlike anything that this the, the couple will have experienced prior to this disclosure. Yeah. When ironically, sometimes the, the having the full truth, as painful as it may be to deal with for, for both of them, because there's a lot of maybe shame in the process for the person disclosing, but, um, you know, having, having had the truth, <clears throat> it actually allows for may, cre the creation of a sense of safety. Maybe That's right. for the first time. That's right. Yeah. 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 Thank you. So, um, you know, there, there's a lot of ways to do these disclosures, right? And we, all three of us, we do them regularly. Most of what we do is the same, but there are even some differences in how, how the three of us do them. So, um, let's talk some options there. What are some different ways you've seen disclosures done? Well, that, oh, Dan, you gotta go first. Yeah, I get to go first. <laughs> well, that's the, the great thing was, in fact, one reason that our, uh, that the, the workbooks ended up so, so big was actually Janice and I don't do disclosures the same way necessarily. There's a lot of similarities, yeah. but what we wanted to do was not say this is the way to do a disclosure. Right. There's, there's more, there's different choices along the way. Here's the decision points to make. How do you want this yeah. disclosure to work for you and your specific relationship? So that's why we ended up with, uh, more there yeah. than we had thought. So Janice and I actually had to come to terms with, you know, for example, mm -hmm. she does a lot more in a, uh, you know, solo or does a lot more in an intensive format than I do. I personally like to have two support people there all the time with, with a couple from beginning to end. And, you know, I know that that can be costly and it can be difficult to, to manage, but that's something we do. Or one way would be, you know, we, we typically advocate for a written formal disclosure, but not everybody right. does it that way. There's an option for a verbal disclosure, which can usually happen quicker. Um, sometimes we can add in, and I, th I think the way you do it too, Jake, is a little bit different, but you can add in the, the piece of connection and attachment and, mm -hmm. you know, reconnection in, in beautiful ways too. So this doesn't have to go one way, but that's my, yeah. that's my first start. Janice, anything you don't want to add to that? Well, for me, like we actually started right there writing these workbooks before some of the shifts. There's There's been some really important shifts um, in the profession as a whole in the last few years. And so we actually started before those shifts happened. And for me, it was really important that choice be the central piece, particularly for partners, because you and I, Jake, we have, have some similar training, trauma training sure. kind of pieces. And uh, between us, we cover a lot of turf. And the, the commonality amongst any any trauma training is, is the piece that was always missing is, is, is what you restore, which is often choice, That's right. which is often um, the ability to pause and take some time and gather yourself and be prepared to say, okay, now I'm ready for you to continue reading. So the choice right. point um, was really, really crucial. And in fact, um, we sort of set our workbooks up in three sort of separate volumes. Volume one is all about explaining the process to clients in a way hopefully they can understand and explaining the choice points so that they can make um, informed decisions about what best fits their needs and then to find a clinician, mm. you know, who, 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 who um, is willing to navigate the disclosure right. of their choice. Yeah. And so just to kind of put some, put some flesh on this to make it real. So we're talking things, everything from like whose office, right? Do, does, does the addict go to the partner therapist's office or is it? Mm -hmm. And, and I think our answer would be the same. Well, she gets to choose, <laughs> right? But you say that Jake, you, you kind of chuckle, but, but that's a huge thing. It's that's huge. not universally we recognized. Say Where that. Do we do this. Yeah, we <laughs> right. can say that, but, but you have to really know. And that's, that's not necessarily yeah. the way it's done. Yeah. 
everywhere. There's no shot clock. You know, um, my original disclosure is kind of, I'm in the DFW area. Um, you know, if it doesn't get done in a 50 minute session, well, we're coming back next week, mm. which is kind of like, can you imagine your surgeon in the middle of the surgery said, Oh, you know what? I've got my <laughs> next appointment. Uh, just freeze the blood, stop bleeding, you know, oh, scab over. Right. We'll finish it. We'll finish it next week. There are a lot of things that have really changed a lot. And I like, I'm, and I'm very proud because I think AppSats has been a part of sort of pushing absolutely you know, a lot of those changes, but there's still lots of places in this country and other countries where there's very little choice. Right. Right. So, yeah. so let's, uh, cause I want to give them some of these choices. So how, so where it takes place, how much time is devoted to it? What are some of the others? Um, Set up for the room. Set up for the room. Who's, like when it's my office, there's no, there's no therapist chair anymore. You know, there's, there's a, yeah. you know, you go into a therapist's office and it's pretty clear what the therapist chair is or the professional, <laughs> right? You know what I'm talking the about? The throne. The, the, yes. yeah, there, that doesn't exist. And it, it, whatever, wherever the partner wants to sit, where do they feel comfortable? What's the spacing between right. them and their partner? What, you know, where do they want the, the support people or person to be sitting? Um, mm -hmm. You know, breaks, all those kinds of, how many breaks? do we have on this, uh, you know, pausing, stopping, there's all kinds right. of choices who comes in and who goes, does the partner stay and start in the room and then the, invite the addict in, or do, does a partner want the chance to be able to move and come and go? Those are, those are some pretty practical. Yeah. Well, the ambiance as well, a lot of, a lot of things, the ambiance, some partners, this is like really sacred. That's right. And we treat it like a sacred ritual, uh, for people of faith. For example, we have a, a clinician who's also a minister, and if they want the room blessed, um, he, he will. That will that will be done. If they want him, if if, a, if possible, if they want him to come and start with prayer, we'll do that. It's bringing the the objects, the symbol, the symbols, right? Um, the symbology of things that are really important to me. If uh, if my grandmother's necklace mm. has been something, the first thing that I clutched you know, in discovery, and it brought me a sense of comfort, then I'm, I'm going to want to bring that my grandmother's, you know, necklace to the disclosure. Um, other partners, it's like, no, I don't want to treat this like some something sacred at all. Um, I'm coming in my sweats. Uh, we're, you know, let, we're going to kick off our shoes. We're going to, we're going to ceremony it down. Yeah. And for others, it's business. This is business. I'm, I want to treat this like a business stance. The yeah. other choices for, for example, for partners is what types of information do you need to know? Yes. Um, we also wanted with this workbook series um, for it to also to be helpful for clinicians and coaches, that who, who anyone who facilitates disclosures, because it's really awful for me. The times I've been in, the, I've learned information kind of from the, the other therapist at the last minute and mm -hmm. would she want to know this? I don't like being in the position to have to like, you know, control the Make flow that of information. Call. Yeah. 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 So it's, it's figuring, it's like really some thoroughness mm. and really working with the partner um, so that it, it does meet her needs. Um, and that so, and, and so that she's sort of vetted all the possible options and outcomes and coping plans are in place, boundaries are right. in place. Yeah. Right. Right. So um, how about the, question of timing. Like when should this happen? It's another topic that is hotly debated in our field. <laughs> yes. is when it should happen. I don't know. <laughs> well, generally, I don't know if you'd agree with this, you guys, but I would say we usually can't do disclosure soon enough for the partner. And we usually can't wait long enough for the addict. So That's, they generally need, the addict yeah. generally needs more time to be emotionally, spiritually, you know, physically, mentally prepared. Uh, and then the partner generally can't, we, we have to do this ASAP. So right. some, yeah. some zone in there. I, I don't know what you'd say, Janice. I, I think the field has shifted to doing these quicker than in the past. Yeah. Um, I don't know what the standard used to be, but maybe, maybe some people waited a year or more years. years. Oh, that, that would have been early. What the standard was just a few short years ago. Yeah, in 2013, so, I did my the the 
uh, CSAT training in 2013. And I know at the time, some of my supervisors were saying, uh, until the addict gets 90 days of sobriety, there can be no disclosure, right? And so that partner is waiting and waiting and waiting. And I've had, I have had couples come to me that have literally waited three years because the addict hasn't gotten 90 days of yeah. sobriety. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, they get to 29. <laughs> I have a lot. I've had some that they get to 29, 28, 29, that boom, there's another relapse. And, um, you know, I, I generally like for both parties being as stable as they can. Sure. But the lack of information also breeds lack of stability. So exactly. it's this real dilemma around that. Um, and um, I, I've had, I've had more than a few, um, where, you know, we decide, you know what, let's, it's going to be years, if ever, if we wait for the 30 day sobriety, and then you start working on all of this, because then if you start then, then there's months of sometimes work afterward. I've had a lot of um, addicts who have only gotten sober after disclosure. Ditto. Yep. Yeah. There's a, this is something that I appreciate Janice, Janice's mind mindset on was uh, this idea of disclosures on the continuum. So there's there's benefits and risks either way. The longer you wait for a disclosure, the more likely that the addict will f have a better understanding of, of the what they've they've done, the, the impact, the reasons behind it. They may, may have an understanding of the betrayal and have more empathy. So that is definitely true. They may have more maturity and, and, uh, and, and have a fuller, deeper dive into, into their behaviors. So that is a benefit of waiting. The obvious drawback is the the research that, you know, Janice, you want to talk about the research? That that was mind blowing for me around the the wait time uh, distress for partners. That was actually really important for me to realize the big drawback of waiting too long. Well, that came out of the um, APSATS research. The, uh, um, and we looking at the impact, the emotional distress um, of, of the discovery comparing that to the emotional distress of the, the planned full disclosure, um, and then also comparing it to the distress of the wait time between discovery and disclosure. And the numbers kind of shift back and forth, so I may be off for today, but it's somewhere around the initial discovery, or sometimes I call it the initial dawning. Mm. Like it just dawned mm. on me, it hit me. It finally added up and I see it for what it is now. Oh, I love um, that. The, a, yeah, like on a on a zero to ten point scale, um, zero zero being no distress, ten being the most imaginable. The average uh, distress rating was I, for discovery, I think, is about nine point six four. Wow. Um, that yeah, that's it's wow. really high for partners. Okay. Um, and and interestingly. Um, addicts taking our addict surveys generally got that the partner just, you know, distress was much higher than theirs, but they, based on, it's, it's an extrapolation here, but it looks like they're actually underestimating how intense it is. Um, the full disclosure itself averaged a 7.7, .7, which I always like to point out 7.7 .7 on a Richter scale is a major earthquake. But the distress of the weight, no matter how calm she might look on the surface, the distress of the weight was 9.2. Wow. It was significantly higher. Hmm. Well, it was higher. And significant has mathematical terms that I uh, probably should not be using. It probably now, was, though. But, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. but it's, it's, really, it's really painful. And so when weighing the timing, and how long you wait for that, you also have to have to weigh in that that nine point two. Yeah. Oh, that's so good. That's so good. So I, I want to shift a little bit and talk about another option that's out there for some. They consider an option. Some say absolutely not an option. Some say it's the only option. Uh, polygraphs. <laughs> <laughs> do we do them? Do we not? Do we love them? Do we hate them? Uh, yeah. What you think? I'll take ahead, a stand. Janice. I like them when they're done well and then when they're done with informed consent, which is like anything else there out there, polygraphs aren't, uh, they aren't foolproof. Right. And they're absolutely not the only 
you, you can't put all your eggs in the polygraph basket. Right. But I do tend to like polygraphs because what I think it often does best with the majority of people going through a disclosure is it, get, I see people get a lot more thorough when they're contemplating polygraph. Agreed. And, and if I were to do it myself with any, any kind of activity that I do that I probably ought not be doing, whether it's um, like too much sugar or, or this or that, if I were actually to just to write my own based on my memory of what I've done, it, uh, there'd probably be a lot of gaps. But, you know, if I was going to take a polygraph on that, I, pr I might go through the trash and look at the empty containers. <laughs> I might take a look-see in the pantry to see what's missing or what's, you know, missing in the fridge. I would go to a much higher level. Um, I might, if I, were, if I were disclosing party, maybe use some of the same memory techniques that the partners do um, to be as thorough as I can. And, and if, I guess most of the, I think most of the people I work with have a, a generally good intent for the sure. disclosure, but that holding on to a few pieces. Uh. But if I knew that I was taking a polygraph um, and that there's no way out of that, I'd probably want to get that information out to my partner before the disclosure or or at a minimum before the polygraph. So I do think it helps. It's a memory aid. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Dan, anything you'd add to that? Yeah. I mean, we have to say it is controversial for sure. So anyone listening, you have to understand depending on where you are, you know, some places don't have good polygraph examiners. So that's, that's a thing where it's not used very well or, um, mm -hmm. I'm a big proponent. I've seen it. I've seen it really helpful for both. Um, I leave the choice up to, to the clients, to the couple. Um, but I, I've absolutely seen the value of them. And I, I want to emphasize, this is a fidelity polygraph, not a forensic polygraph where that's right. Where a fidelity polygraph is trying to validate the truth here. It's, you know, the person's not going to, you know, make something up that's not there, but they want to give every chance to have this person pass. So, right jogging the memory, you know, sometimes I'll, the guy I generally work with, it'll, he'll, he'll, you know, something may not be going too well and be like, I think there, are you telling, there's something you're not telling me. And then he mm -hmm. gives them a chance and right. we can, we can do things a, a different way as opposed to trying to catch someone in a lie or, right. you know, yeah. ambush somebody. That's generally yeah. not how they go. No gotcha questions. We want them to pass, you know, it's, it's, a, it's meant to be supportive and, uh, hopefully the examiner understands that. Yeah. And that's, I think having a good examiner who gets the process and I've had more often than not the the unexpected byproduct for the, the addicts I've worked with, once they've gone through it once, they're more likely after that to say, you know, if, if the partner gets triggered or something comes up, they're more likely to say, I'm not, you know, they'll validate. I, it makes sense that you'd be triggered based on what I did in the past. That's not what's happening now. I'm willing to take a polygraph on that. So they have this baseline of like, I'm yeah. willing to do this if it really, if, you, if that would help you feel safe. And right. sometimes that's enough after they've already been willing to do it to say, I'm willing to go through, do whatever it takes to help rebuild safety and trust for this relationship. And that goes a long way. It does. Yeah. It does. Yeah. I've seen, I, I've seen people do it, you know, use the polygraph, not use the polygraph and certainly depending on the couple, you know, they can still heal, but something about having that external validation seems to just speed up the process of rebuilding yeah. trust, you know? So, um, yeah. well, I, I want to ask you guys this. So I hear that there's a, uh, certification and training program in, in the works under development. So for some of our listeners who might be professionals, can you speak to that? Yeah, we're really excited. We're starting up, uh, AppSets is going to be sponsoring a disclosure certification program. Wow. So for anyone that's a therapist or a coach, it'll be a way to, um, to learn how to more effectively facilitate disclosures. Our goal yeah. is to help. I mean, these things can be, can be difficult and, and potentially damaging if they're not done safely and effectively. So right. to having more of a streamlined process for professionals. So we're really excited to have this thing, uh, coming out, rolling out hope next year. Yeah. yeah. Okay. 
Yeah, I would also say that, you know, we wrote the workbooks as if we're talking to the clients. Um, but there's actually a lot of, um, there's a lot, like, there's an infrastructure under that um, that um, wasn't really necessary to put in, in, in terms of that, but, but really understanding that piece, for example, for, um, for partners, um, like the, the, the volume two, which is the actual prep for partners, um, is a, a polyvagal, like under, mm. underpinnings of like all of that. So for therapists who really want to, like, how do I do this and like factor in trauma, good trauma recovery, right. um, you know, good nervous system kind of working at a higher level with that. Um, we, we kind of pull back the cape. That's on, great. On all of that. Uh, and then also created some tools that okay. uh, so specifically for the, the, the person who's guiding the disclosure that really wasn't uh, a part of the workbooks that we did. Okay. So we're talking 2023 and where would they go to find out more information about that eventually? Maybe it's not out there yet, but is it? It. I don't think it, so. It it's appsets, I assume. You know, I, just emailed, I, just emailed, I just emailed Dan and said, hey, I'm, I'm booking into January because we were looking at trying to kind of get that out in January of panning a date. Um, but when we get that, I've got on like under my, my name okay. um, website and there is a section on the website for yeah. consultations uh, and supervision. And if you go to that link, okay. uh, we will keep keep information there, including if you want to just sign up for us to send, you know, yeah. send you when we get great. Them. Um, it's yeah. solid. Yeah. We'll have all the links down below the video or the audio. Um, and the one Janice is referring to is intensive hope.com. And so be on the lookout, right? Is that right? Okay, mm -hmm. cool. Hope.com. Good, good, good. Go ahead. Yeah, we're actually on our way um, at the end, toward the end of the month, to film some role plays. Um, you know, okay. yeah, to use as tools for the for the training. Um, yeah. So I don't know why, Dan, but I'm sort of I'm excited about that. <laughs> I think it's because role play seemed to like um, capture the intensity. Totally. And and whether the professional has their own experience. Or they're just thinking about clients that were really dear to them. That's like, oh, I wish I'd known this then. Um, I, I think the role plays, at least in the app sets training, uh, seems to generate a lot, um, a lot of thought. When, when I did the uh, multidimensional partner trauma training with AppSats, I did the role play. Dan was there. Uh, I, I, Dan, I don't know if you remember this. You were worried about me. <laughs> it was so intense. It really, you know, it was, yeah. uh, it was an intense experience mm -hmm. and you like came over and, and even checked on me. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think just kind of knowing I had have my own story around a lot of this stuff. And so mm -hmm. that's, that's really great. So any professionals out there hearing this and you're interested in that, you know, that just shows you how, uh, seriously they're taking this and those those sorts of investments, you know, d creating those videos and doing those role plays. I agree. It, it takes it from all that head knowledge to something we viscerally feel and can appreciate. Yeah. So thank you for doing yeah. that. That's amazing. Well, well good. It, yeah. Go sorry. Ahead. I was just gonna say, I mean, one thing like seeing Janice, for example, doing a somatic intervention, mm -hmm. we can talk through the intervention, but to see it in action, I know for, for me, I learned so much more by seeing and doing than I do by you know, reading a script or something. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Absolutely. So um, let, let's go back to our, our listeners who aren't professionals. So let's say someone's listening. They're like, okay, this is new information for me. I didn't know what the word disclosure meant, you know, 30 minutes ago. Uh, I need to know more. I need to learn more about this process, mm -hmm. more about how this works, more about if this is the next step for me. Uh, what would you say to that listener? That's volume one, isn't it, Dan? <laughs> yeah. Give them the name. I have mine right over there. I could reach it, but it, my arm's not that long enough. Well, well, <laughs> probably the practical thing is, is, is to give you the color. That seems to be the way people kind of remember. And, and there's, it's really his and hers companion series. So there's, there's a, uh, 
the the the, the blue book um, mm -hmm. is for the disclosing party, and the green book is for the um, is for the partner. But volume one covers all of that from understanding kind of what it is and why the heck we would do it and discounting um, myths and sharing options about how you might do it, how you even find um, a therapist or a coach or another kind of professional, um, you know, who, who might help guide you through that process. Mm, that's good. I think maybe the only difference is there's a little bit more information about polygraphs in the partner one because that's. It's a hot topic. Yes. Um, it is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm really grateful that there's so much more out there, so much more information about disclosures out there. So I, it, it's, um, I'm glad to hear that many savvy partners are, are able to find out about disclosure usually before they've even contacted me. So mm -hmm. that's nice. Right. That there's so much information out there, so much good information too. Um, but yeah, what we tried to do in, in the the workbooks was to to the whole first volume was saying what is disclosure and is it right for me what's the benefits risks what are the myths yeah. um polygraph all that kind of stuff so and what's the choreography kind of what's it typically look like but yeah. um in terms of where you get that there are both of both books are on amazon the partners is uh full dis full disclosure seeking truth after sexual betrayal and then, um, Dan, I don't remember what, what to <laughs> the, the addicts is <laughs> it's full disclosure, how to share the truth after sexual betrayal. Excellent. Uh, okay. So I want to try something fun with you guys. I haven't done this with anybody yet, but I thought these are the people to try it on. So are you scared? Is that yes. For you? <laughs> but I need to warn you about something. Cause since we had to switch yes. computers, yes. um, to a different computer in order Your to battery. have this lovely conversation, my batteries, so I'm going to dip below and, and plug in right yeah, now. Yeah, sure okay. you are. Please uh -huh. dip below and She's plug in. She's leaving, Jake. She's leaving. She, All the tough questions are going to Dan <laughs> right now. Uh, pl go ahead and plug in because we don't want to lose you. So uh, here's what I'm thinking. I want to do a lightning round, okay? And I'll I'll just go back and forth with you two. Uh, I'm going to throw a question or a disclosure myth at you, and you give me your quick, you know, 20 to 30 second response. How does that sound? Sounds super fun. <laughs> We can't do a sentence quickly. You know that. I know. Y'all will take I, a. But, but the thing is, I'm just the one asking the question, so I get to watch y'all sweat it. All right. Let's try it. Let's try it. Hey, if it's not any good, I'll edit it out. Okay. But it's going to be great. All right. So here we go. Dan, you're first. So a client comes in and says, hey, I'm not doing a, a, a disclosure. It's going to hurt my relationship even more. What do you say? I say, well, first of all, I usually empathize. I can understand where that comes from. I usually validate the fact that someone's negative core beliefs that they've learned says I'm defective, I'm bad, I'm unworthy, I'm unlovable. So I have to hide these things that I, I've been doing because if, I, if people really know what I'm doing, they wouldn't love me. So it makes sense that someone would come in with that myth, but the reality is that's just not true. Mm. Uh, it, it, and I think kind of what we said before, this right. disclosure, sharing the truth. Yes, it, it can hurt, but withholding the truth will be incredibly, you know, much more damaging to the relationship long term, especially if the partner's wanting to know it. In fact, yeah. it's usually fatal. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Okay, Janice, you're seeing a partner and you get a call from the addicts therapist and uh, and he says, I'm sorry, we're just not even close to being ready for disclosure. He's still got to work through his family of origin issues to deal with this shame. And you say, um, under my breath or out loud? <laughs> <laughs> this is why I wanted to ask you this one. I love your honesty, Janice. <laughs> well, I probably talk to my yeah. partner about that. Yeah. Okay? I would say, you know, because if I'm doing that, I've got permission. So people mm -hmm. know I'm doing it's right. happening. Uh, but I, I would probably like talk to my partner about that, including um, sometimes we have to like, Sometimes we have to, shall we say, uh, put a little fire um, under some fannies mm -hmm. um, because we all know that we work with, with people in addiction or procrastinators as well. Right. Um, and we all know that um, 
that it's very the probably um, for me even because I also advocate for addicts. I do it. I do it as couples. And some, the single biggest thing that gets in the way is is the relational cycles that get in the way of focusing on it. So I would probably talk with my partner, get a sense of how much longer she can tolerate that, because mm-hmm. it's really asking the therapist is asking me to put his individual recovery ahead of the needs for my client's individual recovery. Right. And we might, we might talk about like uh, timelines. We might talk about some boundaries um, around that so that there might be not, not a punishment, but there's some consequences. So they don't all fall on the partner. We might talk about um, whether or not there's some clever options for that such as, you know, Jake Porter's in Houston and he's pretty (laughs) good at getting people ready um, through like intensives or uh, there are a lot of people who manage the uh, preparation for the document outside of the therapeutic work. Uh, Right. So they're, they're like, we let's, let's think about a team. Is there a possibility of a team that can come in and help speed up that process? That's good. Around that, because we also all know that that in order to work through shame, you have to be willing to face some of it. That's and right. My experience in guiding disclosures is that the the person who usually ends up with the greater personal recovery gain is the addict. That's right. And the data that Dan and I have kind of collected bear that out. So I, I don't I don't necessarily hold this belief that um, that somehow. You can't work through mm. that. That's an attitude that the disclosure is just for the partner. And it's really for both people's recoveries and the relationship. That's a great point. That's a yeah. great point. Thank you, Janice. Okay, Dan, so uh, kind of similar, but but kind of flip the other way around. Um, you're working with an addict and he just says, hey, man, I'm just, I don't think my wife's stable enough. She's just not stable enough to sit through that. What you say to him? <laughs> yeah, that's, and that happens for sure. Uh, what do I say? I think I, well, first of all, I want to know, hopefully I've had a good collaboration with the partner support person. So right. I can, I can vet that. I can say the concerns. Sometimes it is helpful to hear because sometimes the partner support person doesn't know some of the things that are happening outside, but I want to know, is this, is this true, genuine, support for my partner or is this a stall tactic you know i I, hopefully at this point i've had a little bit more relationship with my client but i i'm not the one to be assessing the partner's readiness for this i need to let the person who's actually helping that the partner determine this and and like jana said earlier sometimes sometimes the stability of a partner is not established until the disclosure because of the distress right. of the wait time that we talked about. So yeah, it That's may be right. volatile, difficult time. And she, and she may be unstable, quote unquote, uh, because it's incredibly distressing to know I've got a cancer diagnosis, but I don't know if it's stage one or stage four. So yeah. um, anyway, I, I would say that I, I would emphasize that I might hear them out, but also like, let me check on that. You know, what are you hearing? So I'd hear them out, but I, but I would also try to see, you know, dive back into them, what's happening for them, what's coming up for them in terms of disclosure, fears and threats and anxieties yeah. and things like that. And see if it's, if it's more, which I would imagine to be the case, it's more about their own fear about doing it rather than them trying to be, you know, protective of their partner. Right. That's right. And I would say if Dan calls me about that, uh-huh. he says, Hey, uh-huh. you know, there's some fear about the, like her stability. Um, and I, that's, I don't like that word. If there's some fear about her emotions, right, which is usually kind of what it is facing right. um, that, um, I, you know, I've got a, a different perspective on that because I've been working with her. And if, if there's some validity to that, then what that allows me to do is to talk to her about that and say, hey, there's a reason we created a workbook that has a lot of exercises if you if you need some time for preparation. And the, the preparation is not just for what information you want. It's for how you can handle it in a way um, so that you get through it better. And for me, sometimes that's really great because 
for partners really in that early, those early phases where the emotional roller coaster, coaster is just devastating. It's really hard to then put it on your agenda to do all these little exercises, you know, regulation exercises that help you when you never feel like it. Mm. But if, but if that's a carrot that I can use for, okay, let's, let's show them. Let's start now. Let's start doing those because now there's a, a very concrete agenda that you want. And we're going to, we're going to double up on those. Yeah. Um, and so I, I think for me, it's a, it's just a win-win. Yeah. That's with, great. Uh, with the, with both, both uh, the clinical parties uh, like communicating about that. For sure. Well, that was that was great. That was fun. Guys, I'm so Wait, doesn't glad. Janice get her second question? Okay, okay. I did have one more for her. <laughs> but she, since she answered yours, I was like, okay. Yeah, no, this is a good one. Thank you, Dan. I was going to let it <laughs> I land just want to give the opportunity. One more, you know? one more. Th- and this is a good one, okay? So um, you're supporting a couple, Janice. All right, so you're seeing mm-hmm. them both. And you're talking yeah. about getting ready for disclosure. And he is adamant. The addict is adamant. I have already told her everything. I'm that is an expensive day. I've already told her everything. I swear after I know I have. I don't know why I need to do this disclosure process. I would probably say, Jake, that's wonderful. That's really wonderful. Except for she 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 doesn't really believe you because you've told a lot of lies. Okay. <sighs> And uh, I might say that gentler, but probably not. Probably not. Um, And, you know, the ways that you've told her that have usually been with her having to ask you questions, sometimes five or six times, and the story's evolved. And it happened over months and months and months and months and months. Some of it she doesn't even remember because it was late night and she was distressed. The way that information came out did damage to your relationship. Mm. And just like if somebody has a broken leg that heals really improperly, you know, sometimes you have to kind of re-break it and in order, you know, to stabilize it so it can heal in a way that you can actually use that leg again. And that's what that's what she's asking of you in the relationship. And and I'll probably give you, let me tell you about Dan. Dan, Dan Drake is great. We'll get somebody that helps prepare you for that. And we'll do it in a way that both of you kind of are in sync mm. on what the goal is, that there's some boundaries, there's some boundaries for, you know, if you have concerns about her, I'll work with her. But I'll probably pull out, um, we probably should have had a visual, Dan, uh, um, a, a diagram of the intimacy pyramid that mm. sort of, um, you know, um, in the workbooks that, that we use that, the um, the pyramid works for individual recovery, but it really works for relational recovery. And I might use that to say, okay, so Jake, what did you actually want in your relationship? Mm, yeah. You want true intimacy. Okay. So how, and I pull out the pyramid and the bottom of the pyramid is truth. Yeah. Truth that both people feel that they've gotten the truth. How are we going to get to the top? If we, if we're not even sure about the bottom. That's good. That's good. Thank you. Well said. Well, y'all, this was a lot of fun. I always enjoy you too. You do great, great work. Dan, if folks want to get in touch with you, where can they find you? How can they find you? Uh, at Banyan therapy.com www.banyan, B-A-N-Y-A-N therapy.com. Okay. Or we also have a joint resource, um, disclosure, hope.com. Okay. And Janice, how about you? Preferred way for folks to contact you? Um, Intensivehope.com. Okay. uh, Which uh, we actually have a couple of um, uh, divisions of that. One is is for counseling within Texas. Um, But one, the intensive recovery healing um, is is, is the the spot you go to on the website for all of that. Okay. Well, great. Great to be with you, my friends. I appreciate you and all the hard work you're doing. And uh, looking forward to seeing you again sometime soon. Thank Thank you, Jake. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. You've been listening to Betrayal Recovery Radio, the official podcast of AppSAT. If you've received help or hope from this episode, I encourage you to share it with someone you know. 
If you've not yet done so, please subscribe to our podcast on your favorite listening platform. Thank you for joining us. I'm Dr. Jake Porter, and you can always email me directly at jake at appsats.org. I'd love to hear your ideas, questions, or comments about the show. Until next time, keep choosing to use your voice and live your values. It's good for you and for this world.